Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today at the Swire Properties Lounge in Art Basel, Hong Kong. I'm Jessica Klingelfuss, Digital Associate Editor at Design and Architecture magazine, Wallpaper. For once, it's the moderator who has the impossibly tricky name to pronounce. So let's make the next introductions quite straightforward. It's my great, great privilege to introduce our three brilliant panelists who are here today to talk about the topic, how art and culture can enhance a community's sense of self. To my right, I have Nicholas Baum, the director and chief curator of the Public Art Fund in New York. This ambitious nonprofit organization commissions and stages exhibitions, installations around the city's public parks, plazas, and other places. Its past project reads like a who's who of art world heavyweights, including commissions by Jeff Koons and Anish Kapoor, Sarah Lucas, Elm Green and Dragset, and so many more. We have Michael Zufu Huang, the co-founder of independent art museum M. Woods in Beijing, and also a trustee of the new museum in New York. Michael began collecting art as a 16-year-old high schooler in London, naturally. In just eight whistle-stop years, he's added curator, creative catalyst, style icon, it boy, and just lately from V-Man magazine, art's freshest mogul to his burgeoning CV. And then we have, finally, Magnus Renfrew, the, a, culture excuse me, a culture entrepreneur and writer and founder of art consultancy, Art HQ Group. A driving force of Hong Kong's art scene, he was instrumental in getting Art Hong Kong off the ground, which we now know, of course, as this small, tiny annual arts event, Art Basel Hong Kong. He set his sights now on Taipei. He's launching a new fair there next year, Taipei Dairang. Um, so thank you to Nicholas, Michael, and Magnus for joining us here today. I'd like to start with a three short presentations, short being the operative word, from our three panelists. Um, I'm hoping they won't go longer than four minutes, or you might have a small mutiny from our audience, and that won't enhance anyone's sense of self. So, Nicholas, would you like to do the honors? Sure. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica. It's lovely to be here. And maybe we'll just start off um, with the video, if we can play that. So I, I think we might have missed the beginning, but that anyway gives you um, a little sort of quick visual sense of the kinds of projects that we do in New York. And we made that video for our 40th anniversary, which we celebrated last year. And uh, so Public Art Fund was founded in 1977 in New York City when it was a very different place. Uh, it was nearly bankrupt. There were a lot of parts of the city that were very blighted. Uh, there were parts of the city people didn't feel safe in. And the whole idea of public art was very different to the one that we have today. And in that 40-year that period, public art has really developed, I think, to become much more meaningful to the community uh, and to the sense that a really vibrant, open, creative city should incorporate public art and that the voices of artists should be heard as a part of a kind of vibrant civic dialogue. So let me show you uh, a couple of projects um, We're just our kind of mission statement. We're very much a global organization. We work with artists from all over the world at different stages of their careers, the heavyweights and as well uh, emerging artists doing their first major public art projects as well. And a couple that maybe um, are interesting to look at, you know, the way we work with artists is very much a dialogue. We invite them to New York, we invite them to think about how they would respond to this opportunity. 
which doesn't come along every day, would you like to make a major public artwork in New York City? And so an artist really has a chance to create something special. We're not about, you know, taking off the rack sculptures and just placing them in public places. So a great example might be Tatsu Nishi's Discovering Columbus, which was um, basically, um, if you know Columbus Circle, one of the busiest intersections in New York City, where there's a statue of Columbus on a 70-foot high plinth. So Tatsu Nishi created a living room around the statue. So we actually built this huge scaffolding and a room that you walked into and Columbus was then standing on the coffee table. Um, of course, it hadn't moved, we just built everything around it. Uh, but people were just, you know, completely floored by that. Um, and it was, it was a great kind of way to really transform the experience of something familiar as if you had never seen it before. Um, Tatiana Trouvé, wonderful contemporary French artist, became very interested in Central Park, one of the icons of New York City, and she measured all of the pathways through Central Park, and then using those different measurements, created a different spool of rope that was the length of that walk through the park, and then gave each one a different title, very poetic, referring to culture, music, poetry, literature, protest, the whole history of walking and marching. Uh, you know, another really beautiful way to respond to the city. Uh, Elm Green and Dragsa, uh, who created this fantastic work for Rockefeller Center, which is another one of our kind of regular sites, um, a giant kind of uh, swimming pool that they created standing vertically as if kind of like something in a showroom window and called it Van Gogh's Ear, building on their own language of the swimming pool and the diving board that they've used in, in many different contexts. That wonderfully uh, kind of, you know, surreal appearance right on Fifth Avenue. Uh, last year, Liz Glynn, that we, we were just talking about with Michael, um, fantastic young LA artist. Well, Elmgren and Dragset, I should say, are Berlin-based Scandinavian artists. And that piece was actually uh, now a part of the K11 Foundation and has just been installed. So uh, that's actually a fantastic example of how our projects can actually become global. Uh, Liz Glynn created this work at, uh, in the plaza at the entrance to Central Park on Fifth Avenue and 60th Street. And she was very interested in the history of the Gilded Age, the 19th century, where very elaborate ballrooms and private mansions were decorated, you know, with over-the-top interiors, and only the elite had access to those spaces. So she created her own replicas of one of those grand ballrooms, which of course no longer exist, but cast them in concrete and turned the plaza into a kind of public ballroom. And she called it open house. And everyone could come and sit and enjoy uh, this sort of beautiful location. Um, also last year, Kind of the culmination of our 40th anniversary was a really major citywide exhibition by Ai Weiwei, whom you all know very well. And um, this was a fantastic exhibition because it really activated the city in a lot of different platforms, responding to you know, specific sites like the Washington Square Arch, which you could pass through this uh, kind of large sort of uh, cage-like structure um, the entrance to Central Park, but also things like banners, portraits of immigrants and refugees through history that we put on uh, lampposts all around the city, and uh, over 200 of those. And uh, this was one of my favorite because uh, the, the lamppost there, as you can see, it's right outside Trump Tower. And this is a, a 19th century immigrant to Ellis Island, anonymous now. Um, so, uh, 
and, and there were a lot of other things, bus shelters, posters, things all around the city. Our, just to finish, our newest project that we just opened is with the Nigerian British artist Yinka Shonabare. Really beautiful piece uh, that takes the idea of hybrid identity, like this fabric that's identified with Africa, but which actually came from the Dutch through Indonesia and then to West Africa, very much an analog of contemporary identity. So, uh, so that's enough to give you kind of a, a little bit of a glimpse into what we do and uh, I'll hand back to Jessica. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, now we're gonna hand over to uh, Michael. Can we uh, load up Michael's video? Yeah, I feel um, we, I also have wanna play a video so I can kind of talk over what we do while you know, it's being played. But I just wanna quickly introduce ourselves and you know, thanks. Nicholas, following Nicholas. I think Nicholas um, really engaged the, the public with art, like living with art. You know, every day you see them when you go to work, when you go home. But for us, uh, I think the museum is really where we form a community where you come to us and we can, you know, you can, from our events you'll see, you can learn and you can be, be surrounded by art and you can meet people. So it's really about that. Um, so this is a quick overview of our 2017. So we had three exhibitions. Uh, every exhibition runs around three to four months. Uh, I think, can I put the volume up a little bit? So I think in terms of a museum and program, we're very much like uh, a Palais de Tokyo or new museum kind of museum in China. We try to do very experimental things and pushing boundaries. And we show you know, master artists like Andy Warhol, Paul McCarthy, who just opened, but also very contemporary artists. And sometimes we also do, as we are collecting museums, so we collect you know, Asian antiques um, to contemporary art, to old master paintings, to a lot of video, multimedia works. So we really try to, we see the dialogue between everything. And I think art is really a universal language. So we, see, we show everything together as well. And as my other co-founder was saying, young people is the main audience for our museum. Also is the main audience for contemporary art in China. And when you come, you'll be amazed by, you know, everyone there is under, 35 and everyone's cool and it's packed and you just really feel a, a sense of community and how you know the young generation is eager to learn and eager to um, eager to uh, be a part of the you know culture so we had you know music festivals And they, yeah, they get a lot of volunteers from the audience. We have thousands of people who want to volunteer for us. So we had uh, like one of our typical events is Singles Day. So every month on the 14th. So we also do a lot of uh, online campaigns. So a big part of our how we engage the public is through social media. So our WeChat and Weibo platforms is a uh, very important um, a way for us to you know do events and publish our content. So we also have, kind of have a news platform, uh, like a video, uh, like a media platform. We make you know uh, educational contents. Like we have a channel called Art Cheese. Cheese, it sounds like uh, In Chinese, it's called zhishi, which sounds like knowledge in Chinese. So we actually actively publish contents related to our collection, related to our history, so people can uh, see that and also share on WeChat. And um, you know, um, when you come to our museum, uh, we don't have audio guides like a lot of other museums, but we really use a lot of our social platforms. So we have, in front of each work, we have a kind of monitor. You can just shake your WeChat, because on WeChat you have, a, you have a feature that's shaking. 
you shake it, and the information of the mu the work will pop up. It will be like a, a video or like text, and you can immediately like share it to your friends, and you can you know save it for later to to see. And at the same time, you follow our channel, which you'll keep on getting our uh, getting um, you know information about our events, or our exhibitions, or just um, like like our different contents. Um, so yeah, I think that's a brief yeah. overview, overview of our uh, initiative in Beijing. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, now it's time to hear from Magnus. Well, thanks very much, Michael, and uh, thank you, Nicholas. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the context for public art in Hong Kong over the last 10 years. Just in, in the time that I've been here, things, that, things have changed a huge amount. Um, I think that uh, when I first arrived in around 2006, the sorts of public art projects were very much more uh, exclusively community focused. They didn't really necessarily engage with an art of ideas. They were much more about painted horse parades or uh, things that were, were perhaps um, less conceptually uh, developed and derived. But I think that over the last few years, we've seen extraordinary projects in, in Hong Kong uh, such as Anthony Gormley's Event Horizon, for example, that is a, uh, was conceived for, uh, and I've got just a little slide of that, if I could get the clicker, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is part of the Event Horizon where uh, Anthony Gormley, uh, leading British sculptor, uh, created these, uh, these human figures that were p uh, p poised on rooftops all around Hong Kong. Um, they were some people got quite alarmed thinking that they were people thinking about jumping off. It provoked a lot of discussion about what art should be or should not be. Uh, and uh, I think it really sort of helped to sort of engage with the wider public and, and, uh, and provoke different kinds of thinking. Um, one of the other uh, key events that was, uh, I think, helped to spark conversation in Hong Kong was M Plus's... Um, sorry. Just going back one. Yeah, M Plus's uh, exhibition, Inflation. Oh. Sorry, I'm having technical issues here. This is the one, this is the image that I like. Um, yeah, so this was a, a, an image called uh, Complex Pile by Paul McCarthy, uh, which was a, a 16 meter high inflatable poo uh, that was positioned on West Kowloon. Um, and uh, West Kowloon is uh, going to be the site of the uh, 40,000 square meter M Plus Museum that will rival in scale uh, Tate Modern uh, and MoMA, for example. And this became a huge uh, talking point. Um, there was, this was one of uh, 16 inflatable sculptures that were, 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 were put on the site of the future West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, and in, within a six-week period, I think they'd have had over, well over 100,000 visitors um, to, to visit the site. But there was a, a halfway through the exhibition, or just actually, it was about a week after the opening, um, there was the arrival of, um, there was the, arrival of uh, the duck, which I think everybody remembers. Sorry, there we are. So the arrival of the duck by Florentine Hoffman, and it was moored... Uh, just right across the way from, uh, from the inflation exhibition. And so there was a giant um, uh, debate in the press about what, sh what art should be, whether it should be uh, a, a giant poo or a giant duck, if you like. It very much became poo versus duck. Um, in, in terms of the inflation exhibition, it was a, a way of engaging people, using a visual hook to engage, with, engage people with an art that was about ideas. Uh, whereas the, the duck was much more of a kind of a, a joyful stunt, if you like. Um, but there was, a, there was a huge debate over um, uh, in social media in Hong Kong. And it was the first time, really, that such a huge public discourse was, was had about what contemporary art should be or what public art should be. It was a very different conversation from the ones that we'd had before, which was about uh, painted horses and cow parades. And I just wanted to, to finish off um, with one of the public art projects that I was involved in, which was... Uh, uh, as part of um, the inaugural edition of Art Basel, actually the second edition of Art Basel, uh, we invited the uh, German artist Carsten Nikolai to create a, an interactive work um, which would be uh, 
using the ICC, the facade of the ICC, which is the tallest building in Hong Kong. It's 390 meters high. And we encouraged him to uh, reprogram the light display of the facade. And we took over uh, the rooftop of Pier 9 and created various different light towers. And he uh, created this interactive work where he VJ'd uh, and uh, responded the music and, the, and his own light show in these light towers um, to the display on the ICC. So I'd like just to show you a brief snippet in conclusion. Turn the volume up a bit. We're standing atop central piers in Hong Kong, and behind me is the International Commerce Center, or better known as ICC. It's the tallest building in Hong Kong, and it's been taken over for the next few nights by Karsten Nikolai, a German artist who has programmed a sound and light installation called Alpha Pulse. The idea behind Alpha Pulse is that it's, uh, that Carson is fascinated with different emotional responses for, to different frequencies of pulsating light and sound. And the idea behind this work is that it's at a frequency that it, that's supposed to evoke good feelings amongst the, uh, amongst the viewers. One can download the app from the uh, from the App Store, and uh, there's the ability to point it at any flashing light source and to synchronise it with any flashing light source. One can speed it up and slow it down, and change the different sounds as well. So it's uh, an interactive work. Well, Hong Kong is a very difficult place to have an impact because of the sheer scale of the place. Even a three-storey high item of public sculpture uh, gets lost amongst the skyscrapers. So if one's trying to take over Hong Kong, I think that the ICC is not a bad place to start. Thank you very much, Magnus. Um, so I guess we've seen quite a lot of um, public art here in the initial presentations, and it's quite interesting about taking art into the public arena. I guess it's the most direct way to sort of engage with the community. Um, in London, for example, you've got the fourth Plinth Commission at Trafalgar Square and the Art on the Underground programs. In Sydney, we've got Sculpture by the Sea at Bondi Beach, and now in Hong Kong, we have our first ever sculpture park. So I guess these artists and institutions are creating galleries without walls around the world. And I guess my first question is to, to Nicholas about how we can use art to sort of create a more dynamic city, like public art. Well, it, I, I think it is certainly the case that cities all around the world have placed renewed emphasis on how to create public space, which of course is something that we all need when we live in cities in small apartments, and how to make those public spaces really uh, vibrant, interesting, dynamic. And I think um, actually going back to sort of the title of this panel about creating a sense of self through, uh, through art, I also think, um, in a way, you can't have a sense of self if you don't have a sense of other. And to me, uh, you know, being able to present contemporary artworks that are conceived by one creative mind or, or a collaborative team, but, you know, they're very much a validation of sort of the creativity of an individual. And that is a, a different perspective. That is a way of seeing the world through someone else's eyes. And maybe that person is from somewhere else, is you know, thinking different thoughts, is responding to the city differently. And I think that idea is, is a really important one and a very valuable one. And the, you know, I think what's really interesting with creating a platform for artists in the city is that it's almost the opposite of the kind of you know founding modernist idea of art exhibition which was the white cube and making the most kind of minimalist no distraction controlled environment that you know just allows you to concentrate on the art object but when you do work in you know the public sphere you have 
you have distractions all around you. You have the noise, you have uh, the weather, you have the people, you have the buildings, you have the landscape, and it's constantly changing and dynamic. And I think that, that relationship is also a really interesting one and allows us to kind of perceive ourselves in different ways as we kind of go about our daily life. That, that's very interesting. And just going back to the inflatable duck and poo, um, so you talked about how this sort of spurred a discussion among Hong Kongers about what art should or shouldn't be. I mean, if we're installing these massive artworks in like very public locations, should art sort of be democratic? Like how do we consult people about the works they have to look at when they're outside? I mean, or should we even have to consult them? Because there have been like quite a few controversial works in the past, you know, that have sort of like split communities. Um, so Magnus, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's an, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I think it's um, uh, it, it's a it's a it's a much broader question in a sense. But um, I, I think that it's it's for the general public. I think that it's it's useful to see things that are outside of their own knowledge and comfort zone as well. I think that people want to. Um, it's useful for people to have their minds expanded by seeing things that perhaps they haven't encountered before. And so through having um, expert curators who can help to put together and conceive of projects with artists, I think that it, it, it has the potential to introduce people to things that they may not have come about, come, come to see before. Um, so in a sense, I think that it's, it's I, I'm a great believer in, in, in knowledge uh, and in experience, and I think that it's important to have people that really know uh, the full range of possibilities rather than things to be um, so, so democratically uh, selected, as it were. And so do you think, um, for example, you said how quite a lot has changed in the recent years. If these works were installed today in 2018, do you think the public reaction would be quite different to the, for example, the Anthony Gormley work? Uh, I think that it's still at a, quite an early stage of development in terms of the, pub, the wider public engagement with art. I think that a lot of the, uh, in Hong Kong at the moment, a lot of the engagement with artists tends to be through uh, commercial uh, contexts and such as the art fair or auctions or even commercial galleries and institutions such as M plus are going to play an incredibly important role in introducing work that's not necessarily that commercial it's not decorative it's not designed to be um, in some ways uh, finding a permanent home in somebody's domestic environment or what have you and I, I think that uh, public art fulfills a, a similar non-commercial function if you like which can um, uh, can create work that's not just trying to necessarily to please people, but actually to spark conversations, to spark curiosity, and to make people think differently. Yeah, so I think it goes back to, as well to Michael. If you have like a quite interesting approach. So obviously you're not showing works out in public, but you spoke about how the museum uses social media to reach probably more people than if you know come to see a show outside. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, for us, like, we're not really out in the public, but I think, uh, like New York is a great example of how we really f art really forms a community and that really helps shape the community around you. So, like in New York, every area uh, that used to be like, like, like a like undeveloped area that artists go in and the community forms, institutions, galleries go in. Then you know, I think we see so many examples with like Soho with. Chelsea with you know now Williams work, uh, I think institutions and uh, white cube spaces still come play a big role in, in that as well. And then for us, I think um, yeah, of course, social media is very important for us um, just to um, be able because we have audience from all over China, but we're only in Beijing, so we want to be able to present them uh, the content that you, you can see on your phone. And also just to further um, form a community. So we have done events on, the, on social media that's related to the exhibition. So for example, for our exhibition uh, last summer, there's a work by Jillian Waring that's basically she uh, crowdsourced everyone online to send a, a, a clip of them opening their curtains. And I think the, the work is really powerful in terms of you can really see, because the internet, you can see views all over the world. You can see like 
Africa, and you can see a view from a refugee camp window, and you can see, of course, Hong Kong or New York. So you really see, um, like, because of technology, is great because you can see everything, but also the places that's most developed with technologies, your views is really dead. It's like another building in your face. But if in Africa you open the, your curtains, there might not, not even be a window. Um, but it's the most beautiful view. So we kind of, that's one of the events we did online. So we received thousands of people who sent us their window view all over. So you really see our audiences, not, not just in Beijing, there's all over the world. And um, so we kind of put that, compile that piece into the exhibition as well. So it's one of the things we did. Uh, so, uh, so we did a lot of different things that's related to the work and engage the public so they can be you know, interacting with art and culture. I guess the sort of just like engagement online is just much more immediate these days. We didn't have that sort of online community 20 years ago when we we had sort of um, kind of art. Um, did anyone go see the Oliver Eliasson talk yesterday? He gave a very great panel discussion. He said something quite interesting about how people engage with art and like viewers having sort of that moment of realization when they look at the piece of work and they go, "This this actually expresses what I believe in." I had not yet found a way to express it, but art gives me a language to say, this is me. So he spoke about looking at art, but instead of just seeing art, that the art was sort of listening to us. Um, I guess, um, how can, you know, how, why is this so important when we are putting these artworks out there? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that that is a, that is a great uh, thing to think about. It's a nice counterpoint to my comment about valuing art because it's the expression of, you know, an individual creative talent. Uh, but that is something we might identify with and, and feel is speaking, you know, for us as well as to us. I think it's um, tremendously difficult to make a really successful public art work it's really much harder, I think, even than making, you know, a successful gallery installation because there are so many complexities. And, uh, you know, if you think of a lot of the dialogue around uh, the success or failure of public artworks, um, aside from this issue of sort of controversy, um, the bigger issue has often just been sort of relevance and accessibility. You know, how does uh, an art practice that's informed by, you know, a century plus of sophisticated conceptual thinking um, create works that are going to be accessible to a broad public and really engage people and be meaningful to them while being authentic to that artist's own voice and practice? Like, nobody wants an artist to kind of dumb down what they do in order to sort of, you know, appeal to everybody. If you do that, you just end up with bland decoration. Um, so I think artists take this challenge incredibly seriously. And most artists are not interested in just, like, um, offending people or or being overlooked. I mean, artists want to communicate and they want to connect. Um, and I think it's, it's our job and our opportunity to give them that platform in a way that's very sympathetic, in a way that does use these incredible tools that we now have of social media where people can find ways to engage and, and relate and express, you know, where it's not only a one-way dialogue um, I think those things are all tremendously valuable. I also think there's a lot to be said for uh, temporary installations because if you're creating a permanent public art piece, that's where these issues of community consultation and so forth become very fraught because everybody feels ownership of their public space. But if you're putting something up that's going to be there for three weeks or three months or a year, then, you know, the stakes are much lower. You can be more experimental and you can, you know, say to people, okay, well, maybe you don't like this, but maybe you'll like the next thing better. And it really is more about 
uh, creating that sense of, a, of an ongoing dialogue. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, there are a number of very important public artworks in Hong Kong that have been permanently based here you know, for the last 20 years or so that have just become part of the landscape and, and they're actually now, uh, that people are so familiar with them in a sense that they don't stop to question what they are. So there are landmark works by uh, Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth in different parts of Hong Kong that just nobody knows about or nobody notices or works by Ju Ming, for example. There's a sculpture uh, park in, in, uh, in, in, on Kowloon side, which has really important works by Eduardo Paolozzi, for example, that even people in the art world won't really have known about and I've only ch chanced upon. Um, so I think that this, this idea of, the, sort of the, how public, public sculpture and public art can actually disrupt people's daily lives and kind of subvert their expectations, create a moment where they can pause and reflect and, and uh, just be a site of curiosity. I think that this, the temporary nature of things is actually a really fundamentally important point. I think for, hello. Hello. Um, I think for me, um, another form of art, public art that's really kind of disrupting people's lives is buildings. Architecture is a form of public art. And you know, every day you see these buildings. And you know, in Beijing, the CCTV tower was super controversial when it came out. But now everyone is used to it. It's become a permanent symbol. It becomes, I think, you know, a pub, it's almost like a sculpture that's there. People, you know, it's a landmark. People go see it, and people go you, know, you tell the taxi driver, like, I'm going there, and they know where it is. So I think, you know, architecture is also very important. And, um, yeah, so I think, you know, even though we're, uh, for, so we try to, like, make sure our museum is also in interesting on the outside. People can see it as, like, a public, you know, sculpture from the outside. Um, so we just, we, for our current building, is renovated by, uh, the Chinese architect, a Chinese architect Dong Gong, who used to work for Stephen Hall in New York, and now he does his own practice. And uh, yeah, he's representing Venice of uh, China for Venice Architecture Biennial this year, uh, next year. And uh, yeah, so he's also known for this kind of building that's almost like a like like a sculpture by the seaside in uh, Hebei. It's like a ch Chinese city that's by the sea. And uh, he made a library, like a, it's, it's called the loneliest library on the internet, it's very popular. So he made a library just by the seaside and it almost become like a public sculpture. I want to go see there, not go there to, for, to use as the purpose of a library, but people go see it and just say, oh wow, this is such an amazing building. Um, so I think, you know, architecture is also influencing a lot of the world. Back to the sort of notion about the longevity of like a temporary versus a permanent um, artwork. Um, do artists, should artists have to think about, you know, balancing sort of present taste with a future taste? You know, what will people think of it in 20 years' time? Will it fit the landscape? Will, will it matter? Well, it's impossible to do that. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's even desirable, really. Um, I think an artwork to be to have authenticity has to speak to the moment of its creation. And we value great historic works because they do embody, you know, something about the moment of which they were created. But not only that, right? That's a kind of founding content, but that each generation can add its own layers and its own responses on top of that. So, um, you know, we, we don't value the great Renaissance murals in, in, you know, churches because we love the stories of the religious, you know, content, right? We've come to layer other meanings and other relevance onto those things. Um, so, so I think it's, I think great works of art are complex and some will be important for a short time and, and a very few will last, you know, for, for history. So I think that's all we can really ask is, is for a sense of something passionate and truthful about our moment. 
think I just have one more question before we dive into the Q&A. Um, it's a question actually for all of you. What do you think is the most pressing issue at the moment about you know, bringing these like art to communities? Well, I think um, public engagement is really important. I mean, that's the reason why you're having public art. You've got to try and spark curiosity and start a discourse and conversation. And so I think that sort of the activation of the projects is really important as well in terms of the education programming, making things accessible for people, uh, for, for people at different knowledge levels, whether they be uh, sort of very familiar with uh, contemporary art or whether they're perhaps looking at it for, for the first time. So I think the education and activation of the projects is really important. Um, I think for us, I think we're very lucky. We haven't faced a lot of challenges uh, because, I don't know, somehow our audience is very, uh, you know, always eager to learn, even though right now we're doing Paul McCarthy show of all videos and very challenging videos, even for me sometimes to look at it. We still have all these amazing audience, and even, even more sophisticated than some other shows that's here and learning about it and writing great reviews online. So I think it's been really lucky for us. And uh, yeah, I think the challenge for us is really, I think we really believe in art in a lot of different forms. So we do, you know, concerts and, um, you know, art perf like performance pieces. I think it's the challenge is really how to kind of merge the audience together and, you know, have them experience different things because some people still you know very much just care about taking a photo at the museum but not really learning about it um, so, but I think it's all moving in a great direction and we're really happy yeah I, I think you know we're living in a sort of moment of incredible shifts in the, the structure of you know our economies um, of our politics, of our communications, and we're really just at the, at the kind of beginning of this digital era and the profound effects that that's having on, on everything in our lives. And so it's, it's um, you know, the same things that are delivering incredible opportunities are also incredibly dangerous. And we're, we're kind of navigating this this world that's so new and has incredible opportunity. You, you know, I see it coming to, to visit China for the first time, and it's astonishing um, the, you know, the culture that's being generated, whether it's, you know, the architecture and the, and the infrastructure of cities, whether it's the expression of, of artists and writers and, and teachers and uh, and people just you know participating through their own communities their social media etc um, so how I think for artists it's an incredibly exciting moment where what they do has the power to matter a lot more than the price they can sell it for you know at an art fair no matter how fantastic um, but beyond that, what's really going to make a difference in people's lives. And I think that's what artists are really excited about now. Thank you. So I'm um, going to open it up to the audience now. Does anyone have any questions? Don't be shy. Hello. Uh, You've all been fairly negative about permanent public art. So if, uh, if you're speaking to somebody who's decided to create a piece of permanent public art, but hasn't decided what, what would you be, your, be your advice to keep it as relevant as possible? Um, well, I, I'm, I don't mean to diss permanent public art altogether. I, I, I think there's certainly a great place for that. And there are, uh, I mean, I think especially where, you know, architecture, which is permanent, is being created and spaces that have the opportunity to also, you know, have art as a part of those developments or 
you know, monuments that are going to be built. Um, of course, they should, I think we should aspire to have the same artistic level as anything you would see in, you know, a great museum. And so I think we have to approach that as a curatorial process. It shouldn't be, you know, it can't be um, sort of choice by committee where everyone has, you know, the same say. Um, I mean, art is not made by committee. So I think, you know, one has to develop a professional expertise and knowledge and ability to, you know, communicate and express and, and bring on board um, people who are interested in perhaps uh, achieving the result, but not quite sure how to get there. Um, and, and to think of, um, you know, to think of, of art as, uh, as something much more than, than decorative, and to really see the potential of what that can bring, you know, to whatever the context is. Yeah, I think I never said uh, I'm against permanent art. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, I think rules is always made by people. And even there is a permanent art or a building, it can be taken down and redo again after 20 years or 30 years. So I think it's really, I'm very like optimistic. I'm really just about people make their choices and you know, life and your world kind of moves along in the, the way it should be. And uh, the things that's really, really good will be kit kept and it'll be a historical side in the future. Like, you know, we go to Venice, everything's great, it's all kept. So I think it just moves naturally. I think that um, site specificity is really important. So trying to create something uh, or work with artists who are able to be sympathetic to the environment in which they're working, to create works that can actually help to activate the space in which they're in. Um, they shouldn't be, I and mean, they need to be conceptually driven. Uh, and uh, as, as Nicholas was saying, I think that, that there's a danger with permanent installations uh, that sometimes you're creating something and you're you're just placing something that's an or, or sort of an existing concept into uh, a particular context and it it's just plonking something there rather than actually creating something that's going to really really reflect the content context in which it's in. Uh, so that's kind of my my take on that. so much and really interesting and it's probably one for you Nicholas so you mentioned um, the artwork that was purchased and is now on display at K11 how much work is the public art fund doing to continue or uh, ensure the continued story of the works that are on the outset initially um, temporary works of art to allow them to continue their stories and allow a greater audience to, to view them well, it's not the works of art that are temporary. It's our exhibition of them. So, uh, so actually most of the work that we commission goes on to have a life. Uh, I was just in Shanghai and a beautiful piece of Alicia Quade's called Against the Run, which is a clock, kind of like a civic clock that tells the correct time but runs, the, the face actually rotates backwards. So it's a real kind of you know, double take um, when you see it. And that's now standing outside the Yuz Museum in Shanghai. Um, so it, it's exciting for me to go, you know, around the world and see pieces we've commissioned in wonderful museums and collections. And, uh, and, and of course, developing those partnerships is something I would like to do even more. I think you know, what we do in New York is, is very special and there are not many cities in the world that have that kind of engagement. And I should mention that, you know, we're not a government organization. We're private, independent, not-for-profit. So, um, you know, the, the difference we're able to make is because people get together and pool their resources and say, we believe that this is important to our city 
and and make it happen. And I think it's exciting to see people all around the world, you know, taking that initiative where they don't wait for the government to do it, they step up. And, uh, and whether it's individuals or enlightened corporations or civic authorities, um, you know, they're all people that I, I love to partner with and that I think we're getting a lot more interest from people around the world saying, you know, we love what you do and we'd like to sort of bring some of that to, to our context. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone has them? At the back there. Microphone's on its way. Um, thanks all for the talking. It's very insightful. Um, I, I have a question. I think um, a lot of public art that you're talking about is in cities um, where they are exciting people and going on social media, etc. What do you think about public art in areas like rural areas or suburban areas? Is there a lack of it and what will it take to get more of that public art out there? Given that uh, you know, art is you know the public art, the, the role of art and culture and community is to access a wider culture or public. So I was just wondering, you know, is there a lack of it, and should there be more for a push for it? Um, you know, I think there. I mean, there are uh, extraordinary places that have become very special because of the. The art that's been installed there, and they, they're out of the way, whatever, there's Judd's, Marfa, uh, there's Naoshima, you know, there are these places that are kind of destinations for very special experiences that you couldn't have in, uh, you know, an urban context. And I guess the great, you know, um, land art of the 60s and 70s, the spiral jetty, and you know, those kinds of pieces could not exist in an urban context. And of course, it's fantastic for artists to have the opportunity to, to do those kinds of projects. Um, they're probably by definition going to be more rare and more special and require, you know, very visionary artists and supporters to, to make those things happen. Um, can we find ways to, to share public art with more communities that are outside of the metropolitan centers? I hope the answer is yes. Um, and I think, you know, as the sophistication of kind of urban planning and of, of city authorities and governments um, in different locations develops, you know, they'll begin to see the benefits of those kinds, that kind of thinking. Hopefully it'll be an organic kind of process. So a, lot of that, a lot of the activation that happens outside of city or municipal areas tends to be privately funded and privately initi initiated. And I guess that the reality for um, policy makers, if there's public funding involved, is kind of the return on investment in terms of what number of, of, uh, of people you're going to be able to engage with the projects that you're putting on. Uh, and so that does lend itself uh, to, uh, to the, the, the cities and the centres of uh, the population centres in general, uh, for good or for bad. Any more questions? Yeah, there's one here. Squeeze one more in. No? Well, thank you very much, Magnus, Michael, and Nicholas, for joining us today. Um, that was very, very interesting. Um, and thank you to our very lovely audience for taking the time out of your day to come along. Um, thank you.